the real crime, the landlord's property value went down so much. Think about how hard it must have been for that landlord to put that property back on the market. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we discussed the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald L. Goldman, or as you may know it, the case of O.J. Simpson, who was Nicole's ex-husband, a Hall of Fame running back in the National Football League, and the case's top suspect. Also, I was a little boy when this happened. But you do know a fair amount. Yeah. I mean, for any anyone our age, he's just... Yeah, I actually never even knew he played football. I just knew him as the guy who probably murdered somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that's what most people our age know him as and his name was The Juice. His name was The Juice. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's just get into it. In the early morning of June 13th, 1994, at 1210 AM, the bodies of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald L. Goldman were found outside Nicole's Brentwood townhouse, stabbed to death. So right now we're on our way to Nicole Simpson's house. Ugh. Is that it right over there? That's oh. it over there, I feel awful. Crazy about this. No. <laughs> such, a, such a cheery, cheery evening here in Brentwood. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh. Good times. At the time, Nicole and OJ Simpson were divorced and living in separate residences, both located in Brentwood. The bodies were discovered by two neighbors who were literally led to the crime scene by Nicole's dog, a dog that multiple neighbors would say was incessantly barking around the time of the murders. So like I said, the dog led the neighbors down the street. I'm not sure if it was this way or that way, but the dog led them to the entrance and they just saw the blood uh, coming out to the sidewalk. This whole place has been renovated, so the entrance right now is in a different place than it was back then, but. You know what occurs to me though, is how close all those apartments were and how it's like, and how no one heard. For some reason, yeah, I always imagined the street was bigger and things were a little more separated, but everything's kind of on top of each other there. I imagine you, some people would have had to hear something. The real crime? The landlord's property value went down so much. Why does nobody think about the innocent bystanders in this? Think about how hard it must have been for that landlord to put that property back on the market. That's a good point, I never thought about that. Let's go through the established and highly detailed timeline. On June 12th, 1994 at 6.30 p.m., Nicole, her children, and others arrive at dinner at a restaurant called Mezzaluna. At 9.15 p.m., Nicole's sister calls Mezzaluna to say that her mother had left her glasses there. Ronald Goldman goes to pick up the glasses. At 9 to 9.30 p.m., Brian Cato Kalin and O.J. Simpson go to McDonald's for dinner. I can't imagine McDonald's was pleased to hear that. I'm no. sure they wished he left that out of the testimony. Was that in the testimony? I mean, it had to be. It's on the official timeline. Oof. <laughs> well, free... It did get a lot of media coverage. Though, I guess. So free, free advertising. I suppose. At 9.45 p.m., Cato and O.J. return home from McDonald's. Cato was staying with O.J. in his guest house at the time. At 9.48 to 9.50 p.m., Goldman leaves Mezzaluna with a white envelope containing Nicole's mother's glasses. At 10.15 p.m., Nicole Simpson's neighbor hears a dog bark and cry while he is watching TV. The prosecution would later cite these barks as the barks of Nicole's dog, who was theoretically crying out at the murder of its owner, Nicole. So, so they're going by dog bark. They're going by dog bark. In a lot of ways, this dog is the real hero of the story, it seems like. I don't know if there's a lot of heroes in this one. No, Ryan. no, but the dog. I mean, if it was a real hero to stop the murder from happening, you know what I'm saying? L, L for the dog. If you want to give it to the dog, I'll then give sure. it to the dog. I'd like to have something happy about this story. And yeah. the dog is a regular lassie. For the sake of just keeping this less bleak, let's it's show a, a picture. Let's show a picture of an Akita right now. I think we could all use that. Please. <laughs> okay. Hey, yeah. something jolly. Yeah, something jolly. At 10.25 p.m., a limousine driver named Ellen Park arrives at OJ's home. OJ was scheduled to leave on a red eye that night from LA to Chicago at 11.45 p.m. At 10.40 p.m., OJ's guest, Cato, heard three loud thumps on an outside wall of the guest house he is staying in. From 10.40 to 10.55 p.m., Ellen Park, the limo driver, buzzes OJ's intercom several times, but there is no answer. 
Just before 11 p.m., the limo driver sees a shadowy figure, six feet tall, 200 pounds, walking across the driveway towards the house. At about 11 p.m., the limo driver tries buzzing the intercom again, and this time, OJ answers. OJ tells the limo driver that he had overslept and had just gotten out of the shower. Doesn't look too good. Doesn't look too good. Could have been a coyote. <laughs> ah, Los Angeles has got its fair share of coyotes running around. A six foot tall coyote that weighed 200 pounds. By the way, for it being a shadowy figure, this guy seems to have a very accurate description of it. I know, yeah. Six feet, 200 pounds. But very shadowy. Smell of McDonald's. At 11.45 p.m., OJ departs on an American Airlines flight to Chicago. And taking us back to the start, at 12.10 a.m., the bodies of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald L. Goldman are discovered outside her townhouse, stabbed to death. Evidence found at the crime scene included a bloodstained glove left by the suspected killer, a knitted hat, and a bloody footprint. Detectives would arrive- Ronald Goldman was hot, by the way, and so was obviously Nicole. ...arrive at OJ's house at 5 a.m. and would discover some key pieces of evidence, but we'll get into that later. Meanwhile, OJ's flight lands in Chicago. According to lead prosecutor Marsha Clark, Detective Ron Phillips called OJ to inform him that his ex-wife was dead. OJ's first response, quote, who killed her, end quote. Not good. Not, how did she die? Nope. What happened? <laughs> who killed her? Yeah, that's not, that's not the go-to there. <laughs> OJ was questioned for three hours by the LAPD but released. On June 17th, 1994, four days later, OJ was charged with two counts of murder, but he famously did not surrender to the police and was declared a fugitive. The resulting low-speed police chase of OJ on the freeways of Southern California in his white Ford Bronco is a lasting memory for anybody familiar with the case. Do you remember that? I actually don't. I think I was not too on top of the news cycle then, because I was watching Power Rangers or something, but I was not. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Maybe you were just eating cereal or some shit like that. Yeah. So I was probably taking a dump or something. I don't know. Is that all you did? That's that all age? I did was take dumps. Oh, well. In my pants. It's a weird childhood. OJ was in the passenger seat. The car was being driven by his friend, Al Cowlings, who would later explain he didn't stop due to the fact that OJ was apparently holding a gun to his own head in the car and that OJ was suicidal. In fact, a suicide note by OJ was found, but we'll get to that in a bit. So right now, we're going about the speed that OJ- Yes, OG Broncos are so sick. I love Broncos, they're dope. Especially the original, the one that OJ was in is so fire. They literally, they restore them and sell them for like 250 grand a pop now. The electric ones, the new ones aren't as cool in my opinion. OJ was when the chase was happening and we're in rush hour traffic for the most part in LA. I thought he was going even slower. That's not an original Bronco. No, they restore ones from the 80s and 90s. Very famously, they restore them from the 80s and 90s with like obviously a completely new engine and, and new everything. And they sell them as like luxury vehicles, basically. It's awesome. I restore Broncos. They're from trucks that people want to look like uh, show cars. You should get one and go full LA f boy. OG Broncos are the worst season notoriously, so they refab that part along with the suspension. Yeah, I had a I I had a Bronco for one day. We bought it from some like secondhand, possibly uh, a criminal Polish person, and it broke in 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 one day. It broke in one day. It was the shadiest thing, bro. I swear to God, it's not even Polish slander. This is New Jersey. Just say Polish. No, no, no. It was like, it was, it definitely, I mean, it was super cheap and it definitely felt like, well, it was definitely a crime the way they sold that thing to us, but luckily they were, they took it back. Even car guys get to eat in this community and you relegate Linux guys to the slums of the chat because I use Linux on my Steam Deck and that shit sucks on, honestly, I'm sorry. I can't say I feel exhilarated right now, nor do I feel like Vin Diesel. During the chase, they recorded a phone call between OJ and homicide detective Tom Lang. I literally need like a 35 minute YouTube video to do like the most basic shit. You refuse to learn? Yes, brother. I don't need to learn. Okay. I'm sorry. It's crazy. Anything I need to do on, on the Steam Deck, on the Steam Deck side, dig her. Thank you for the 10 tier. I give the subs. Anything I need to do on the Steam Deck that is on like the actual PC side of it. 
literally requires a 35 minute YouTube tutorial. It's so annoying. It's not intuitive at all. I'm sorry. I love the Linux Andes. I get it. It's great. It's the most socialist operating software. Oh my God. True boomer mentality revealed. First of all, one, I am a, a boomer. And two, Linux is definitely more boomer coded than any other uh, OS is out there. What are you talking about? Steam Deck isn't even a real desktop OS version of Linux. Yeah, that's like the most like user friendly version of that too. And it's still hard. Here's some audio from that. Nobody's gonna get hurt. I'm the only one that deserves. No, you don't deserve I'm that. Get hurt. You do not deserve to get hurt. You do uh, not deserve to get hurt. Don't do this. All I did was love Nicole. That's all I did was love her. The chase would end at OJ's home in Brentwood. Inside the car, they found in what I imagine was unintentional humor, makeup adhesive, a fake mustache and goatee, OJ's passport, and a gun. Just try to picture one of the most famous people in the world trying to sneak into TSA with a glued on mustache and thinking that it's gonna work out. Bro, back then, that was no TSA. We laugh now, but that literally, this is pre 9 11, this is the 90s, bro. You can bring a gun on the plane. Imagine a world where you just walk onto the plane with no checks whatsoever. Not even, um, I don't even think they even, back maybe in the 90s, they might have had this, but I don't think they had metal detectors even. Yeah, I can't believe he was even considering it. It's a little juvenile. OJ surrendered to the police at 8.51 p.m. Let's go over OJ's suicide note. Aside from thanking those who meant a lot to him in his life, OJ professed his innocence. Quote, first, everyone understand, I have nothing to do with Nicole's murder. I loved her, always have and always will. If we had a problem, it's because I loved her so much, end quote. And with that, let's get into the suspects. Unlike our other cases, this case has one clear top suspect, OJ Simpson. So let's break this down into two sections. Why OJ is the killer and why OJ isn't the killer. Let's start with why he could have done it. First off, let's start with a possible motive. OJ and Nicole Simpson had been going through a break, and around the time of the murders, Nicole and Ronald Goldman had reportedly grown increasingly close, leading some to speculate that they were perhaps more than friends. Though Goldman said that wasn't the case. That obviously is a clear motive right there. Yeah, well, I mean, even if Goldman had said that that wasn't the case, it's, I don't think that's gonna matter if no, he's spending any time with I mean, him. that's a meme now, the guy you shouldn't be worried about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> in the most extreme case. Now, let's return to the timeline. If the murders did in fact occur around 1015 when the dog barking began, as the prosecution suggested, that would give OJ enough time to commit the murders, clean himself up, and be back at his house by 11 p.m. to greet the limo driver. Right now we're heading over to OJ's Rockingham estate, which was actually only six minutes away from uh, Nicole's townhouse. So, so it's feasible, especially if he was uh, clipping. Damn, these houses are nice. Yeah, these are very nice houses. This that's, is, I think, it. That supposedly is it. Yeah. Oh boy. Um, so this is the former site of OJ's Rockingham estate. It was demolished in 1998, but uh, happy to leave. Going into DNA evidence, OJ's blood, as well as Nicole's and Goldman's, were found on the glove left at the scene of the crime. Further damning was the fact that this glove matched a glove found within OJ's estate behind the guest house near the area where OJ's friend Cato heard loud thumps at 10.40 p.m. Both gloves had blood on them that matched Nicole, Goldman, and OJ. OJ also had a cut on his finger the day after the murders when the police interviewed him. The knitted hat found at the crime scene contained hairs that were proven to be OJ's by the FBI Hair and Fiber Laboratory. Also found in OJ's residence was Nicole's blood on a sock. Blood was also found in his driveway. The bloody shoe print found at the crime scene matched OJ. But when you put it like that, OJ's size and the sole pattern matched another pair that OJ owned at the time. OJ had also purchased a knife matching the type the coroner predicted the kill used. Uh -huh. Though, the knife and the shoes were never found. This is where a lot of people uh, sort of draw the line, right? <laughs> when you have three separate pieces of evidence that have DNA connotations linking you to the murder. If you're looking at, at the surface here, boy oh boy. That's an avalanche of 
he he done it right there. Yeah. So God, maybe we should just show a picture of that dog again. Just just like yeah, just just show, every time we get sad, show the picture of the dog. And bring that up. Bring that bad boy up. It's right there. Good. It's a good dog. Good dog. Another key detail was the fact that OJ had been a perpetrator of spousal abuse against Nicole Simpson in the past, reportedly resulting in nine police visits to the Simpson residence responding to domestic disturbance calls. In 1989, OJ was found guilty for spousal abuse and pled no contest. Police show up and they're like, okay, what do we hate more, a black guy or women? And that's where the whole, I'm not black, I'm OJ conversation kicks in. You know what I mean? That's why I, I, I've been saying this from the jump. It's just like, dude, any other circumstance, I feel like they probably, as much as they love domestic abuse, this is around the time when that famous 40% study came out, by the way, self-reported, where they asked thousands of cops if they do domestic abuse, and 40% of them voluntarily said they did. Very quickly, they were like, we should never allow a study like this to ever be conducted ever again to the charges. Bizarrely, OJ himself actually wrote a book in 2006 called If I Did It, a hypothetical account of the murders. Though the book was first canceled due to public outrage, it was later published with the profits going to the Goldman family. Oh boy. That's uh... Holy shit. <laughs> That's all I have to say to that. You're just uh... <laughs> redefining. This guy's got some nads on him and in the worst way possible. For those that are new to this case, O.J. Simpson was found not guilty in court. Despite the DNA evidence found at the crime scene, the defense team called to the attention of the jury technical mistakes made by the forensic team, which created some doubt over the evidence. Evidence was not packaged correctly and even left in a van to overheat. This ultimately led to them suggesting that the crime scene may have been contaminated. Grasping at straws. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a forensic artist. I know. I know you're not. Yeah. Artist. In case you're wondering, I'm not. He is not. But uh, from my knucklehead perspective, this looks very bad. During the trial, the defense team had OJ try on the glove found at the crime scene, and it was too small, leading to the now famous line by his lawyer, quote, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, end quote. Gotcha. He, he, he Dr. Seussed his way out of a murder, mm -hmm. so... Though, it's worth mentioning the prosecution team was against having OJ try on the glove because it had been frozen and unfrozen multiple times as a preservation method. It had also been covered in blood. I don't know how glove freezing works, frankly. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a glove freeze artist. No. Many believe that race played a factor in OJ's acquittal due to the events that surrounded the trial. In 1992, race riots occurred due to the LAPD's senseless and horrific beating of a black man named Rodney King a beating for which the assaulting officers were acquitted of all charges. The defense strategically used law enforcement racism as a reason for OJ's charges. They showed a video of Simpson handcuffed as soon as he returned from Chicago, demonstrating the Russian judgment by the police. Perhaps one of their biggest arguments was centered around Detective Mark Furman. During the trial, the defense played for the jury a tape of audio in which Detective Furman was recorded using racial slurs over 40 times in one recorded sitting. This is no bro 40 times in one recorded sitting. My man was an Olympian, dude. He was a gold medal award winning international champion of saying the N word. It's like you have to try super hard to be able to say it that many times that quickly. Noteworthy because Detective Furman was the first man to step inside OJ's Brentwood Rockingham estate after the murders occurred, a feat he accomplished by jumping over the wall of OJ's estate. This is a critical detail because according to Detective Furman's own testimony, it was during this time after he jumped the wall that he alone discovered the notorious matching bloody- This is why it's like, this is why there was reasonable doubt because the way he gathered the evidence yeah, Mr. Divorcelli would be envious of the amount of times this dude said the M word on record, you know what I mean? Glove behind OJ's guest house. With this information, the defense was able to suggest that Detective Furman planted the glove and perhaps all other evidence found at OJ's estate, effectively tainting the evidence, regardless of whether or not it was true. Christopher Darden, a deputy district attorney assigned to the OJ case, summarized it in this quote. Quote, it will do one thing. It will upset the black jurors. It will say, whose side are you on? The man or the brothers? End quote. The jury was made up of eight black people, one Hispanic person, one white person, and two people of mixed race. 
all these things could i know you believe that there was reasonable doubt but do you believe he could plant tamper with the crime scene i'm sure but do i believe he could have done that absolutely do i still believe that it is infinitely more likely that oj simpson did a very bad job of covering up his tracks overall yeah that that thing if i was weighing it if i was weighing both of those odds i would go along with yeah no he definitely did it bro come on it's not it's not just the gloves that were a, a, a major role here there was so many other pieces of evidence like that's crazy if the mark Furman interview was one of is on one phillips cassette tape he would have said 0 0.44 slurs a minute <laughs> The point is, it makes sense, especially given the time frame of when this super publicly, this super public trial was happening, that there was enough reasonable doubt. Oh, God, I love defense attorneys. Attorney, we put up photos of black people in OJ's house, so we looked family friendly. In the People versus OJ Simpson, America, sorry, defense lawyer Johnny Cochran is shown pulling a switch just before the jury visits the football star's mansion. He personally supervised the removal of photos that show Simpson and his white friends and the redecoration of the home with African art and photos of the former pro footballer with other African Americans. In this scene, Cochran hung a painting by Norman Rockwell, which became an icon of the civil rights movement over Simpson's fireplace. Oh, that's so dude. They're so awesome. This is the, this is the photo that he put up on OJ's house. Just they're such they're such scumbags, dude. But you really, sometimes you really need a scumbag to go up against the criminal justice system. You know what I mean? They're awesome. I love defense attorneys. All right, let's continue. Considered, the jury reached the verdict of not guilty after less than four hours of deliberation. However, it's worth mentioning that OJ lost the eventual civil case for the wrongful deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman with the jury awarding their families 33.5 million in punitive damages. This episode- Have they found the killer yet? No, I heard the killer died actually recently from cancer. They were, they were suspicious. Uh, they, were, they were saying that he might have, uh, yeah, they were saying he might have died to cancer, the killer, at the age of 76. But it's bumming me out, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's this not. is a very depressing- Racist, bro. They're, they're bummed out that a black man gets to roam free, dude. You see that? Not me. Just in case this is the worst. <laughs> but if OJ didn't kill his ex-wife and Ronald Goldman, then who did? Let's get into some alternate suspects. The first suspect is serial killer Glenn Rogers. <laughs> in an investigation discovery documentary, Clay Rogers, the brother of serial killer Glenn Rogers, said that while on death row, his brother Glenn confessed to murdering Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Though, even if this theory is true, OJ would still be guilty. Glenn Rogers reportedly had been hired by OJ to steal a pair of Nicole's earrings from her condo, but was told to kill her if she got in the way. However, it's possible that Rogers was serving a six week jail sentence at the time of the murders and thus lied about his involvement. I feel like people in prison for murder and serial killers tend to just claim things. Yeah, why do they do that? Sometimes people will claim things uh, in an effort to make themselves seem more accomplished in that field, I suppose. Well, none of us are impressed. No, Serial I'm not killers. impressed. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna really let it sink in. They're gonna see this video and be like, he's right. Pack it up. You know what? Let's, what, are we, what are we doing? Stop it. You're, you're really hitting at their heart right now. Stop keep it. Keep going, keep going. Maybe it'll make a difference. Stop serial killing. The last suspect is Jason Simpson, OJ's son, and is the sole theory of famed private investigator Bill Deere who is one of the few private investigators to be inducted into the Police Hall of Fame. Though, it's worth mentioning that many have discredited Deere's case as almost entirely circumstantial. Nonetheless, Deere presents his theory in a book, and the highlights are as follows. At the time of Nicole and Goldman- OJ's innocent and I can prove it. That's awesome. How many, how many M words did he say? How many slurs did he say that, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> that he was inducted to the Police Hall of Fame, dude? They were like, damn, this, this guy is, ugh, fuck, we lost a good one, boys. He could have been the police commissioner with how many slurs he was on, you know? In murders, Jason was on probation after having attacked his former boss with a knife. According to Deer, Jason had also attacked a former girlfriend named Jennifer Green. Deer also spoke to another former girlfriend of Jason's named Dee Dee, who claimed Jason almost broke her back after throwing her into a bathtub, and perhaps even more suspiciously, cut off her hair with a knife 
giving Jason two reported assaults. In Bro, does big homie also have the CTE pass on to the child? What the fuck's going on? Involving a knife. Deer also reportedly obtained medical records of Jason's, illegally some might add, by dressing up and impersonating a doctor at Cedar sinai Hospital for two weeks where Jason had been a patient. I don't like I mean, this guy. he tricked people in a hospital for two weeks. People were murdered. And this guy's playing dress up? <laughs> I know, but I'm just saying. Like, oh, That's why he was a Hall of Famer. Well, he was doing it because he was. He was a Hall of Famer. He was on a funny wig. In his, <laughs> in his mind, he was chasing justice. I mean, apparently the police Hall of Fame thought so, so. Is that a real thing? Yes, it is. I wouldn't be surprised if it was just him making that up. Him in different costumes being like, yes, we're a real organization. And he cuts Talk the video. The president. So yes, talking. hello, I'm the president. <laughs> hey, it looks like that other guy just got a mustache. <laughs> According to Deer, Jason had been diagnosed with intermittent rage disorder, and around the time of the murders, Jason stopped taking the prescribed antipsychotic drugs. This was also during the time when Jason reported- It's so funny that none of this is evidence. Like, absolutely 0% of this is evidence so far. Absolutely 0% of this. Virtually every single, I mean, it could be evidence that he is abusive to his current girlfriends, right? It's evidence that he was abusive to the other, um, the, the other Hassan OJ truther. OJ covered it up for him. Okay, dude. When they told doctors he was, quote, going to rage. Jason's alibi was that he was working at a restaurant that night. Deer feels this is a flimsy alibi due to the fact that his time card is reportedly handwritten, which could suggest it was forged after the murders. This reportedly handwritten time card looks even more suspicious when you consider the fact that the electronic time clock at the restaurant was fully functional that night. Deer also reportedly has pictures of Jason wearing a knitted hat that bears resemblance to the one found at the scene of the crime. Pictures that only exist before the murders and not after. To cap this off, Deer suggests that OJ was only present at the scene of the crime to protect his son, and that this would explain his bizarre behavior after the murders, such as the infamous Bronco chase, but, as mentioned before, many have discredited Deer's case as almost entirely circumstantial. Unrelated to it this is. case, on September 16th... It is entirely circumstantial. Especially when there's physical evidence that ties OJ to the scene of the crime. It's ridiculous. The bar is way lower to, to indict his son. Maybe they put him in the Hall of Fame because they were like, Oh yeah, not only are we locking up OJ, we're going to pack up another black man, his son. That's why they were like, yeah, this guy's awesome. <laughs> this guy's dope. <laughs> he wants to arrest every black person. One reason why we felt it was OJ's son, because when we when he approached the Bronco, when they arrived after the chase, OJ's friend was driving, punched his son in the face and started pointing and yelling at him. I'm sure you can find the footage. Why would his son indiscriminately go and attack OJ's ex-wife, chat? Like, even then, the circumstantial evidence doesn't have... Like, OJ has a motive. Anger issues doesn't mean you... I said he was off his meds. Dude, you are so... Okay. Being off your anger medications is... Why are you indiscriminately defending the racist police? Because I'm racist. That's why, as you guys know. Like, it just doesn't make sense for him to, like, seek out his stepmom. His ex-stepmom. Anyway. 2007, OJ was connected to a robbery in Las Vegas, Nevada. In the 2008 trial that followed, OJ was found guilty for 12 counts, including armed robbery and kidnapping, and was sentenced to 33 years in prison. According to CNN, the overall percentage of Americans who believe OJ did murder Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman has increased from 66% in 1994 to 83%. You have to remember that he was apparently unhinged at the idea of his ex being with coke dealer and party boy Ron Goldman. He was seeking her out because she was making his dad's life hell. No, that's bullshit. In 2014. Chas so addicted to arguing with you, they're seriously defending OJ Simpson. That's really wild. I mean, is it really that wild? Not as wild as the fact that they get hit with a top of the hour ad break at the top of every hour. And that probably is part of the reason why they want to defend. They want to argue on every issue over and over again till the goddamn cows come home. You know what I mean? Yeah, all the physical evidence is, uh, is OJ's, man. It's crazy. <laughs> Percentage of Americans who believe OJ murdered Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman was 66 in 1994, 83% in 2014. Yeah. We just got more races as time went along, I guess. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Certainly, there are a lot of implications. Yeah. Nuanced. Very nuanced. I feel dirty. I feel
Yeah, for the record, I didn't know that the the Goldman family actually authorized this. And because I guess they couldn't change the name or something. Like OJ Simpson titled it If I Did It, which is insane, but then they authorized the the cover, right? So they made the if tiny on purpose to be like I did it. Which by the way, they ended up getting money from, so, you know, I'm partial to the second OJ theory. Wait, what? God. Patrick Bet David, will OJ rest in peace? Oh my God. Oh my God. I can't wait to hear what Patrick Bet David has to say about this. Like oh, yeah. Shower and then a bath. Yeah. And then another shower. Yeah. They changed the name to add Confessions of a Killer. I need a drink. Well, thanks, Ryan. This has been a blast. Yeah. Let's oh. just go. Okay. <laughs> Ouch. Perhaps. This murder produced the funniest quote of all time. Oh, yeah. This is pretty funny. OJ Simpson says he avoids Los Angeles because he feels he may be sitting next to whoever did it. I worked at a bookstore when the original book came out, but it got held and we couldn't sell them because of the lawsuit and it was eventually shipped back to the publisher.